Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haeramai, and welcome to this episode of the Niche Cast coming at you on the 23rd of January. As the Aotearoa Sporting Times, they rock and roll, they keep moving and grooving along. We have uh, a lot of cool stuff to chat about today on our podcast agenda. The Breakers had a win, shout out to them. The Black Caps had four wins, then a loss in their T20 series against Pakistan. So we'll be chatting lots of bits and bobs from that series. We might open it up to explore some of the test squad stuff as well. We've also got Super Smash Cricket heading into finals, although there is a very important Otago versus Northern Districts woman game being played just after we finish recording this. So that will be very interesting. I don't think that Otago versus Northern men's game has any major ramifications because they are the bottom two teams in the ladder. So we will be talking Super Smash. That heads into finals. I think there's a finals elimination final on Friday. And then the grand final will be on the weekend, probably on a Sunday, I'd imagine. Auckland, I believe, are hosting it. And then the Wellington Blaze are already cruising into the finals as well. So Auckland and Wellington women... Auckland Aces and Wellington Blaze are the best teams in the Super Smash heading into that final stanza. And we'll talk lots of bits and bobs about Super Smash as well as the Black Caps in our cricket segment. Might even throw out some White Ferns ideas as well if they pop up. We have a little Flying Kiwis Chicken and we've also got a review of the Wellington Phoenix weekend action. The men had an epic draw, and I believe the woman had a loss, but it's away from home, so nothing new there. That's all good. The Our news that went out yesterday, and there's a few things in there that we won't be talking about in the podcast today, but are still quite funky. Lydia Ko had a win in her first tournament of 2024, and that's quite interesting because when Lydia Ko is playing her best golf, she starts the season strong. Last year, she had a down year. The the cyclical nature of sports um, didn't swing in her favor. So she had a down year last year, and that started with a few poor results in her first five tournaments. The two years prior, when she was on fire, she started well. So hopefully this win, I think it was in Florida, hopefully this win sets her up nicely for a couple more good results in the top five. We also had the Black Sticks men, qualifying for the Olympics. They defeated Pakistan. I think it was a third and fourth playoff of their qualifying tournament. Black Sticks men won that to save New Zealand hockey, really, because the women didn't qualify. And it's pretty fascinating when you consider that the men have consistently played worse or had worse results at the Olympics than the women. Then the men were relegated from the FIH Pro League as the woman maintained steady results before opting out. So neither Black Six team is in the Pro League. One team opted out, the other was relegated. The team that was relegated qualified for the Olympics. The team that opted out to focus on Olympic qualification didn't make the Olympics. So it's a fascinating situation there. Either way, at least there's one team from New Zealand hockey participating in the Olympics. And, of course, we had another Charlize Ledger Walker outing that you wrote about in our newsletter via Substack. The nichecase.substack.com. Sign up for a Monday and Friday dose of Aotearoa sporting information as well as the subscriber podcast, which is sent out to paid subscribers through Substack and the Patreon Fano. We'll have our subscriber podcast coming out later this week. But what's the gist of your uh, Charlie Sledger Walker yarns? I actually read it and it was, was, if if you don't mind, it was basically Charlie Sledger Walker isn't filling up the, uh, the scoring stats anymore. She's just setting everyone else up. And you've laid that out in previous podcasts. That was your latest update as well. Seems pretty cool. Charlie Sledger Walker growing, developing as a player, making everyone around her better in the NCAA basketballing ranks. Yeah, and they had a game on telly yesterday morning, so I was watching that as I was um, starting my work day off. And when you 
because I'd, I'd written that exact idea before. We talked about that ex- exact idea about how like her scoring is actually the lowest it's been in her four years of at Washington State, but her rebounds and her assists are at career highs. And uh, from what I understand, I haven't looked at like stats on this, but from you know people who follow this stuff, it sounds like she's also having her best defensive year as well, which would stack up to those other... Um, to you know add to the the wider theme um and yeah i i'd written this before we talked about this before but then actually like watching a full game of hers and getting that idea with that idea already in my head and seeing how it unfolds in a game I, it's just it's another perspective and you you see it just in uh in closer focus how much she really influences a game like just the uh pulling the strings and stuff it's not quite like chris paul level um uh what do they call that like the um the the point guy the point general type um type player because she's still trying to get to the rim and attacking defenders and um doing the sort of dynamic stuff it's not just stand here pass the ball here tell everyone else where to go but she really does like you make a cut to the rim around Charlie Sledger Walker, she's going to get you the ball somehow. And just the array of passes that she was making, specifically that type of pass as well, to, to hit um, to hit teammates running towards the basket for layups was insane. Like, it's just over and over and over again, the whole, the whole game. Um, and I sort of went from that into looking at whether now that we're getting closer to the WNBA draft, which would be in, I think, I think it's in April, um whether there were like the mock drafts type things for that the way that there are for the nba it's obviously not the same depth of coverage but that's good because most of the depth of coverage on the nba draft is just irrelevant it's there's too much of it to mean anything um but yeah for, there are a couple of sort of examples where i found that she wasn't mentioned i think espn only did one round but didn't have her in their top 12 but then there are also a couple others i think the athletic the lead of one or two of the usa today was another one um, who all had a being picked at least in the first two rounds, and a couple of them had a specifically both had her going at seventh to I think Minnesota. I don't know if that draft order is set or if that's just expected or whatever. I don't know how they do that. Um, point being that we expect that a player with her kind of um, uh, college pedigree, the the achievements that she's um, that she's achieved <laughs> the achievements that she's achieved the the accolade she's accoladed will will be drafted into the WNBA we sort of know that but then we're sort of seeing now what that like a little bit more specifically what that might mean and there's like top 10 potential here for for what she's doing which for a career low scoring year says something as well it says that some of these other folks are paying attention to the same things um that's exciting. And there also is an Olympic qualifying angle to this as well, because she will be part of the Tall Ferns Olympic qualifiers, which are next month, like not not far away, very soon. She's missing some, she's got leave from um, Washington State to go and play in those games. Does sound like Panina Davidson's probably going to be injured. She's picked up, uh, I think, a groin strain or something with Melbourne Boomers. So that's very worrying because there's your best rebounder. You've, um, and this is already a Tall Ferns team that's a little bit short on size. Uh, like, I think, um, uh, you know, they've had a couple of their centers give birth in the last couple of years and they're not quite back. And uh, Nina Davidson also being out is going to leave them, if not short on size, because there are alternatives, but definitely short on experience in this center position, if that's the case. Like, you, there's one or the other at this point. Uh, but they are going to have Charlie Sledger Walker and they are going to have Tara Reid coming off uh, what has been so far an absolutely fantastic uh, WNBL campaign in, in Australia. She's been fan- she's been great, like a starting level contributor for for Melbourne, who are probably the best team. Um, and it'll be building off that Asia Cup as well. So there's a there'll be a good solid core of those players who are carrying over. A few youngsters might be getting a chance just because of injuries elsewhere, but they're they've got a hope they've got a chance of qualifying for the olympics the reason they don't normally do that is because they don't normally get through the asian qualification now that they have done that they've got three games and you've got to finish in the top three of your group of four so they're playing against france who are the hosts and who are already there uh they're playing against um china who whooped them at the asia cup 
So those two games, France are really good. China are really good. Probably not winning either of those. But we might be Puerto Rico in between those two fixtures. And that's the one to target. If they can win that, there's a good chance. It's an almost certain chance, really, that they'll be going to the Olympics. And I haven't been to the Olympics since 2008, I think it was. Is that right? Yeah, there would have been a 2008 Olympics. And it was that long ago that when they last went to the Olympics, Susie Bates was playing for them. So, <laughs> so it, they'll have gone from Susie Bates to Charlie Sledger Walker, if that's the case. So two world-class athletes, although one ended up being so in a different sport. Uh, but that's another another exciting aspect of the Charlie Sledger Walker newsreel over the over the upcoming weeks. It's it's going to be an extremely busy twenty twenty four for her. Sounds like you're describing Charlie Sledger Walker as a bit of a Amelia Kerr or Rhea Percival type of athlete, where they are one of the best players in the team, if not the best player in the team, but everything they're doing. You know integrates the other players brings the best out of other players they do they operate in their sport um in a team as players who can make everyone else better around them as well so that's uh that's good for charlie sledger walker and we and you could have read about that in our newsletter via substack in each case dot substack dot com we, you can also explore a lot of our deep dives. I've done a Super Smash Youngster breakdown. We've got a Black Caps versus Pakistan T20 series review. You can read two deep dives about the Wellington Phoenix on our website, the news-cage.com right now as well. Flying Kiwis will be coming out. Got lots of rugby league coverage there as well that is still applicable right now. Kiwi NRL junior stuff, New Zealand Warrior stuff. There's a lots to read about on our website, the news-cage.com. And if you're listening to this, watching this on YouTube, big up to you. Have a subscribe. And if you're jamming the podcast, let us know how you're listening as well. We're out here doing our best to broadcast Aotearoa Sporting Excellence. And you can also support us on Patreon. So you, there's two ways to support us straight up the guts, paid Substack subscription, Remember the Monday and Friday newsletter, that is completely free. You just sign up, no worries. And then you can upgrade to a paid Substack subscription if you want and access the subscriber podcast, or you can join the Patreon Fano. You can access the subscriber podcast there as well. And if you do want to make a one-off donation, you can go buy me a coffee, or you can just uh, jam any of the uh, supportive methods that these media platforms provide how about that let's get a bit of mindfulness before we dive any further into our Aotearoa sport Alrighty, uh, i have dipped into the spiritual sayings of khalil gibran here and found <laughs> opened up a random page and grabbed the first one that stuck out which was sayings remain meaningless until they are embodied in habits I think is a nice one to have every now and then when we're considering the like the purpose and the intent <laughs> of these mindfulness segments. <laughs> it's nice to remind us as well that it's not it's good to talk about stuff, but it's better to do stuff. I obviously we're not perfect and we don't embody all these things all the time. We probably barely even like spark them into motion, but we do try our best. Like we do live, we do try to be mindful and place gratitude over material possessions and those type of things so i think we do a pretty good job of embodying the mindfulness that we do digest every week and i would say you you always hit the mark with your mindfulness so i do feel like when you deliver a dose of mindfulness for however long whether it's an hour after the podcast maybe it's the rest of the day i do try to embody it because you uh you do hit the mark you, you do have timely intuitive connections with your mindfulness and whatever woes i'm going through <laughs> yeah well i um i mean i'm not writing the mindfulnesses i'm <laughs> taking them from other people yeah. and i'm generally taking something that i feel applies to, or at least connects with me in some way so i suspect if you're finding that um if you're finding that there's reasons in which it vibes with you, I think that's because there were reasons that it vibed with me at the same time. 
I would like to drop my weekly Kiwi NRL pocket here to start the the meat of meat and yeah, shout out the vegetarians, the meat and the hearty veggies of this podcast because I want to touch on one specific area of the NRL and that is the Brisbane region, the greater Brisbane region because we've got the Brisbane Broncos but we've also got the Redcliffe Dolphins and the both teams love Aotearoa. Specifically, well, not specifically. One team prefers first fifteen rugby in Aotearoa than the other, but they are, they both love Aotearoa and they are both well stocked with Kiwi NRL youngsters primarily. Like the Dolphins, do have like the veteran crew, the Bromwich brothers, Jeremy Marshall, King. Uh, Jermaine Sarko, Aotearoa Kiwis winger as well. There's a lot of solid NRL talent in that in that Dolphins outfit. But what a lot of people probably don't know about the Redcliffe Dolphins is they've come into the NRL and they're recruiting Kiwi NRL juniors straight away. I've talked about this before. They've got Peter O'Sullivan running their recruitment and junior development, scouting, all that stuff. What does Peter O'Sullivan do well? Scouts players from First 15 Rugby Union. So, Valence Tafare. For all the... He's, he's, he's had a wee tough period this summer trying to maintain the uh, NRL weight, whatever he needs to do, and stay in tip-top shape for the NRL season. But anytime time you're seeing Valence Tafare buzz from Australian media, whether it's his weight, whether it's... Uh, Val Meninga. Let's chill out on that. Let's just call him the house because he is Valence Tefade. He is Valence the house and he's built like a house. So let's call him the house. But he was a really nifty pickup from first, from Rugby Union in, in uh, Aotearoa. Not first 15 because he had finished first 15 and then he was picked up to play uh, for the Dolphins. So this is another, so you, like, again, the Australian media, they love the league versus union angle. They're all about union knee, league niggle. They can weaponize this. They can be like the NRL is recruiting players from rugby union in Aotearoa at a, an immense degree, which is evident in the first 15 talent, but it's always also evident in players who leave first 15. Because Valence Tafari was recruited after finishing First 15 Rugby Union. Leo Thompson was recruited by the Knights, or recruited by the Raiders, after finishing First 15 Rugby Union. Tavita Henare Schuster was recruited by the Roosters after finishing First 15 Rugby Union. So that's how the NRL scouts are operating right now. It's not just the best First 15 players like uh, Kalis Putoko or uh, Tavita uh, Tavita. No, Fahu, who was apparently signed to the Dolphins. I actually haven't seen him in any photos or any kind of official list, so I'm still curious about him. There are that there is that top level first fifteen talent that is going to the Kiwi NRL ranks, but there's also players who fall out of the rugby union system who are opting to choose rugby league as well. And the Dolphins, they've also got the first fifteen talent. They've got John Finiunga Nofo who followed in the footsteps of Keanu, of Dean Mariner especially, maybe Keanu Kinney, in playing Australian schoolboys. John Finiunga Nofo, he went to Auckland Grammar, played first 15 there. Then he went to the Dolphins, played his first season this year, played Mal Meninga Cup, which I think was at under 18s last year, up to under 19s this year. And he basically played under, he played Mal Meninga Cup, Hastings Daring Colts, which no longer exists, and reserve grade. Fresh out of uh, finishing Auckland Grammar School first 15. Dolphins also have Elijah Rasmussen, who is an absolute big bopper out of Westlake Boys High School first 15. And he is apparently on the fringe of the NRL squad right now, but he's also eligible for England. I think he was born in England, then moved back to Aotearoa, um, or moved to Aotearoa. So watch out for Elijah Rasmussen. He is a big bopper for the Redcliffe Dolphins. And as I said, Tavita Nofahu was listed as a Dolphins train and trial member after playing for St. Kent's first 15. He also played for the New Zealand schools rugby union team last year, weeks 
before being listed as a train and trial player for the Dolphins, playing NZ schools alongside Kalis Putoko, who is now with the Titans. But again, there's nothing official with uh, Tevita Nofahu. Like, I can't actually confirm where he's at with the Dolphins right now, aside from the unofficial train and trial list, which came via the Daily Telegraph. So watch out for that. Of course, the Dolphins are going to be well stocked in their junior ranks. We'll wait and see how those teams look to start the season. Case uh, the main point though is that the Dolphins love Altero. You know they've also got Connolly Lemuelu, like Tefare, the house. They both went to Tangaroa College. Connolly Lemuelu. He's also got a first fifteen background uh, with Papatoi Rugby Union. Let's go to the Brisbane Broncos. So I had the Dolphins entering. The Kiwi NRL Power Rankings at 11th. Their first year, after their first season, their first year of availability in the Kiwi NRL Power Rankings, they're 11th, which is fantastic for them. Then you go Brisbane Broncos. I had them third in my Kiwi NRL Power Rankings. And the Broncos, they have grown in their Kiwi NRL recruitment and the quality of their Kiwi NRL recruitment. Started with Jordan Rickey. Then you had Xavier Willison. Then you had Dean Mariner. Now you've got two other notable dudes there, Kylam Vunipula and Nathaniel Tangamaititi. Tangamaiti, maybe. Probably need to get that right. Um, Jordan Rickey, he had a fantastic season. And then you also had Xavier Willison and Dean Mariner growing into their season. But I don't think they've played their best uh, footy for the Broncos just yet, but they are going to be major factors in the coming years. I can't do this Googling while I'm talking, so we'll stop that. Um, <laughs> but the Mariner and Willison are going to be major factors. Again, Broncos, real hearty Kiwi NRL recruitment. Dean Mariner wasn't a big, big Donny in Auckland. Broncos recruited him gets into their system. Now he's one of the most potent outside back juniors in the NRL. Xavier Willison, he was recruited from Waikoua Bay. Not necessarily like a, the, like a dominant representative players there with uh, Willison and Mariner. But then the Broncos recruit them, get them over to Southeast Queensland. Now they're really high quality QNRL prospects. I was saying late last year, both of them would be top 17 players at a lot of other NRL clubs. Now they've got another nifty recruit in Kylam Vunipula, who is from Danny Verk, I believe. And he is a center who center fullback type of player who, to me, he looks quite similar to Shans Nukul Krokstar. So watch out for Vunipula, who does seem to be um, on the cusp of the NRL squad as well. Um, yeah, I'm curious to see where he lines up because he will be a very interesting youngster to track there. And then Tangamaititi, Tanga he was playing for Wyndham as an edge second rower and center. And he has been in the Broncos system for a couple of years now. Watch out for him. He's an Ellerslie Jr. in Auckland. And the Broncos brought him over to go to school and play junior footy there as well. Of course, the Broncos also have Josiah Karapani, apparently, who left the Rabbitohs to go to the Broncos. Another lively outside back. And the Broncos will also have a lot of players in that under-19 Mal Meninga Cup bracket as well. So there is a lot of Kiwi NRL talent in that Broncos Redcliffe region, let alone the Titans, who are one of the busiest Kiwi NRL recruitment pockets um, and then you've got the Cowboys up north who are a bit far away. But that area, Broncos, Redcliffe, Titans, is still a hot pocket of Kiwi NRL talent. All three of those NRL teams are bringing youngsters over to go to school in that area. And many of them, uh, they arrive at a young age that all the Australian media just assumes they're Australian. But they have been placed in schools or their family has m moved over with, you know, connections to go to school and stuff like that. They've all been put there um, by their NRL clubs and they 
do a great job of it, to be honest. Like, I'm not going to say anything negative about it because these dudes get to go to school and they also enjoy. Yeah, so here we go. I was waffling on as I was looking for this. Tanga mai, tanga ma taiti. Tangi ma taiti. Nathaniel Tanga Maiti. He is a good edge forward center for the Broncos to watch out for. Started with, uh, I think he was with South Slogan for a while there before going across to win him. Oh, never not impressed by how well you can just reel off these junior names who aren't even like NRL players that people have had a chance to learn or whatever. It's like getting in on the on the base level with um, like even stumbling over one name is astounding that you <laughs> get through that many. I, and the the like, because I was when Scott Morris signed for Stoke City footballer earlier like last week, and then Stoke City on the same day had a had like an eight minute clip on their on their youtube of a training session like highlights from a training session just to, inside a inside the club type um type content and i'm just like scanning through this trying to find a, a hint of scott morris and like will i recognize him if i saw him and then i'm i don't know like all these when everyone's just running it's like i can't i can't tell so i don't know how you managed to pick faces out of like photos and stuff as well in the end i did find some scott morris at the end because they did some um shooting practice so it was easy to tell who the goalkeepers were like once once you put the gloves on and stood between the sticks that narrowed it down for me but uh you don't really get that benefit watching rugby league players either uh so maybe a little bit of positional stuff i don't know but always um i don't know and i <laughs> The shameless plug uh, outro to this um, sentence would be, this is another good reason why people got to jump on the old Patreons and paid sub stacks and support what we do because you don't get this anywhere else. And having said all that, I still feel terrible for not knowing Nathaniel Tunga, Tangi Mataiti, his name officially. And also, I'm still battling this little storyline in my head of like Tevita Nofahu because I went pretty hard at the fact that Tevita Nofahu and Kalis Putoko were both in the New Zealand schools rugby union team that played in Australia then a few weeks later they were linked to NRL teams that hasn't really happened before with New Zealand rugby union selects players for their rep team and Putoko had already played um rugby league i think i said that last week usually the players who play in that top new zealand schools team they've got a pathway to super rugby npc and you know whatever their future holds so i went pretty hard at saying like how tevita nofo and Putoko move to the rugby league but i've like there's been a gold coast titan story about putoko making the move to league there's been photos of him he's played in a bit of trial footy as well there's literally nothing else apart from the unofficial train and trial list that the daily telegraph did about tevita nofahu with the redcliffe dolphins so so as i'm saying all this the things that make me uncomfortable and not knowing the names off the top of my head and also the wishy-washy kind of murky areas where you can't actually say something like is actually certain. You're kind of throwing it out there as this may be happening, which is cool to throw out there, but it never really feels good unless it's like you've got facts and photos and can say it for sure. Yeah, well, it's football transfer window season at the moment, so I'm dealing with a lot of those grey areas myself. I can sympathise. The Breakers did have a good win. And that win was against South East Melbourne, who are bottom of the table. The Breakers are fourth from the bottom of the table, just on the cusp of cracking into the play-in tournament. Uh, but after a bit of a losing streak... They came good against the worst team in the NBL. So I'm not sure if there's anything new to gain from that victory or if it was just the case of, because the Breakers do seem capable of beating up the worst teams in the NBL, but they uh, they have slipped up against the better teams and there's six teams who are better than them. So that's, you know, most of the NBL. 
Um, you can either drop a couple of points about the Breakers versus Southeast Melbourne or big up some more of the Kiwis in the NBL. Uh, we've still got Melbourne up top, Perth a second, and then you've got Tasmania third. So that all looks and feels fairly similar to what we were discussing last week. Is there, are there any new developments there? Anything funky in the Kiwis in the NBL department and or the breakers after their victory over Southeast Melbourne? Yeah, the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix are last, but they're not just last. They're also just like plummeting. Like the, if they could be lower than last, they would be lower than last right now. They've lost five games in a row in their last four games. They've conceded 100 plus points in each of them. The latest of which being the Breakers, putting 100 on them in, the, in a big victory. Anthony Lamb scoring 31 points, and I think about four or five other guys getting the double figures. Still only time to get two New Zealanders out there on the court during that game. No no need to apparently bother with the development guys, giving them some actual development or no, none of that. But good solid win from the Breakers against a team that they absolutely had to beat, and they did. So, they, you know, they're, they're still in the mix. They're one spot out of the playing tournament as things stands a couple wins behind but they do have games in hand i think um not looking at the table right now but i was analyzing all this yesterday um you know they're probably going to need to rip off another three or four game win streak at some point but they've got plenty more winnable games and they're coming off they you know they did that earlier and then they lost three in a row following that and the reason they lost three in a row is because they played melbourne they played perth and they played sydney Sydney are a little bit up and down, but um, definitely Melbourne and Perth are the runaway two best teams in the competition. So that's just kind of where the breakers are at, I think. It's it's similar to what we'll say about the Phoenix women later on and how they win at home, lose away. It's like the breakers, well, they can, they can beat the teams around them on the table. They can't compete with the teams that are better than them considerably. Um, that's just it's the, same, it's the same thing. And that's why I don't see this as any kind of like, they're back, you know. They're this is this is the start of the resurgence. This is the last run. It's, you know, this is just a consistent result for the how their season has progressed throughout. So, good win, like the good tidy win. They you know played the imports played well, well coached. Um, Tom Abercrombie got some good minutes, which is nice because it, that's actually something that's been dwindling a little bit this season, and I do suspect it's probably will be his last season before you know, he toyed with retirement last year. I think probably. At this stage, I think he's more likely to retire than remain for next season. Um, Isaiah Liafa got out there for a little bit as well. He's, you know, he's, he's to be fair, like, it's talk about the breakers not giving enough opportunities to Kiwi players. Like, Liafa's had a few, and if you're being honest with it, he hasn't fully taken them. It's um, it's the same pattern we saw from him at with, with the Tall Blacks at the World Cup, where it's like there's games where he's great and then there's games where he's just not quite as effective. He's always got the effort. Defensively, he's always pretty good, but it's a little bit more about like the scoring inconsistencies where he might shoot like two of eight one game and then the next game he, he makes four triples or, or something like that. You know, he hasn't quite got nailed on that consistency, which is why he's playing off the bench. And you, as much as I would like to see Kiwi dudes playing, more with that team it's also like the better players are the ones who aren't the kiwi guys but then at the same time there are better players than that who are playing for other teams many of them used to play for the for the breakers like the best kiwi player in the in the nbl is shay illy plays for melbourne he was released as part of the like well you're not going to get so many minutes because we want to bring in a um an 18 year old american prospect who can play here for one year which ended up being about a third of the year and before he gets drafted and forgets we ever existed, you know, that's, that's how Shaili got squeezed out of the team. Now he's just gone on to win championships and a bunch of individual awards and stuff at, um, at Melbourne United. He's set out a second game in a row this week. So he's, they're still managing his um, concussion symptoms. He just to be cautious, he didn't play this week either, but incredible scenes with the Perth Wildcats who are the best New Zealand team in the NBL right now? <laughs> Imagine thinking that like five years ago when it was Breakers and uh, it might have even been more than five years ago at this point, but Breakers versus Perth when that was like the decade-long rivalry and there was that stretch where only one of those teams could win the um, could win the championship and the, the rivalry that was going on and now it's somehow the Perth Wildcats are the most fun Kiwi team to watch. 
because they had two wins over the weekend. I think they've won seven in a row and they've won 13 of their last 14. They had a terrible start. They got booed out of their, uh, out of a home game at one point when they lost talking about, will the coach be sacked talking about, will they need to swap some of their imports out um, all these dramas. And then they just like s- stuck to the script, turned things around and now they're incredible. Their only loss in that stretch was an overtime defeat against Melbourne, which if you saw that one when it happened, even just go back and catch the highlights, like that had future grand final matchup written all over at that game. And during this current like seven game win streak, so that's happened since then, one of the key players has been Ty Webster, um, Ty Webster who scored, I think, 20, 20 and 16 or something like that in his last three games. Um, Hiram Harris has been, he actually elevating him to the starting lineup was part of the way in which they began to turn things around earlier on. Like I've talked about these guys in previous weeks, nothing has changed. They're still, do- in fact, if, if anything, they're getting better as the season goes along. But they also had a win against Brisbane on the weekend. A win against Brisbane, which was a big win. Um, Corey Webster got about eight minutes off the bench on top of those other two guys also being excellent. I do, I will say with the um, Wildcats situation, I'm not really sure how Webster, Corey Webster, that is, fits into this. I, I'm not sure he's going to get too many um, big opportunities unless he gets hot in the short space of time off the bench. And then they, you know, sort of earns those um, those heat check type minutes. But I, I'm just not quite sure where he sits in the rotation. Um However, he you know he got he got a solid little um, cameo in that Brisbane win, as did Jack Andrew again, development player, um, getting getting some more opportunities there, and Dante Russo Nats, which means five New Zealanders took the floor for the Perth Wildcats in a single game, which I have no idea how to research this. But knowing the kind of numbers that we've seen in the past from New Zealanders, Australian teams, knowing that that is at an all-time high this season and has been peaking in the last couple of seasons, peaking up, well, leading up to this peak in the last couple of seasons, I've got to imagine that's never happened before. Five New Zealanders in one game representing the same Australian team. You only get to play like 12 players in a, in a single game. Nearly half of them were Kiwis there. And of course, Perth Wildcats do also have... Um, Kiwi American coach uh, Aaron Young on the on the bench as well as one of their assistants. So uh, this is what I'm saying when I say the Perth Wildcats are the best Kiwi team in the NBL right now. They, they might also be the best team in the NBL right now, given the form that they're on, although Melbourne still sit ahead of them on the table and are the only teams who have beaten them over that span. So I think they'd argue that point pretty pretty firmly. But the Wildcats are actually the team to watch right now. It's It's nuts. And I... I just find it I find it so weird to think about that looking back on what that ri- breakers wildcats rivalry used to be and now what it is now the black caps rolled through four straight victories and then slipped up in the uh in the fifth and final T20 against Pakistan the white fern sweep for Pakistan for Pakistan yeah yeah, yeah. the uh not too fussed about that last game. Like it is a, it was the fifth game um, of a T Twenty series. You've already sweat. You've already like won the series. I'm not too worried about the uh, the mishaps in that last T uh, Twenty. But I am curious. Like, is there a player who stands out for you as the most concerning T Twenty black cap? From the Pakistan series or stretching back into what you remember about the Bangladesh T20 series as well, is there one player who you're like worried about, you need to check in with, concerned about, just a bit of, nothing like a bit of negativity. So is there, is there uh, negative vibes around any of these t- T20 black caps for you? Yeah, Devin Conway. I mean, you might need to check in on him for two reasons because he also missed the last couple of games with COVID. So maybe like knock on the door and leave some chicken soup out there for him or something. I don't know, but he... That did that, seem like a convenient illness, to be honest. I mean, it, yeah. Can, uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not doubting that it happened because also Mitchell Santner had missed time. So we know there was there was some COVID in the, in the camp. Uh, and um, who else was it? Andre Adams, eh? Who was called in as bowling coach, missed a game. But... Yeah, it did seem convenient. Like, it's it, not doubting that it happened, but also maybe that was a 
a break that Devin Conway might have needed at this stage as well. So, um, yeah, hopefully a little bit of a refresher. Of this the the way they handed out like sort of little mini breaks throughout the series was a little bit weird though. I thought it was funny that they said Daryl Mitchell was being rested to to balance his workload, and then he turns up and. <laughs> sitting with the team on the sideline talking to the to the commentary in their last game anyways it's not you're not really having a rest and there's two well, it's this is the last game of the series well he lives in Christchurch yeah. so yeah he could have still been at home the whole time but um it is like the last game of the series and then there's two weeks until the test thing so it's not like he had anything else to do in the in the meantime like he was about to get a two-week rest but that's fine it's it's also convenient in the way of like here's a way to give someone else a chance to bat and that didn't go too well for them, for them in that middle order but you know Daryl Mitchell has played a disgusting amount of cricket over the last sort of 18 months and he's 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 allowed to put his feet up now and then even though I think he did say he's not a big fan of watching the cricket when he could have been playing which is funnily enough the reason why I saw Steve Smith saying he wants to open the batting for Australia now is because Manus Labushagni is out there dominating the number three spot. And he says, batting at number four, it just takes too long. <laughs> he gets bored. So he's like, well, put me into open. Um, exactly the kind of sentiment I could hear someone like Glenn Phillips saying at some point as well. And I'd, I'd imagine like, you know, Daryl Mitchell had a stint open in the batting in T20s briefly. Um, cricketers like to play cricket. What do you know? All of that's true. We need a like, so you're most concerned about Devin Conway. That was the uh, initial yeah, question. Yeah, back, back to the start. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we do have the Devin Conway slump. I would also throw out Mark Chapman, who did drop a few of those catches in the fifth and final T20. And that is part of a a slump going back to the Bangladesh T20 series that we need to keep an eye on because Devin Conway didn't play against Bangladesh. But we have explored his greatest slump across all three formats. Um, his three games against Pakistan, 27 runs, average of nine, strike rate of 112. Mark Chapman batted in six games across the two series, and he scored 52 runs at an average of 8.6 and a strike rate of 106. So Mark Chapman was the best T20 batter for the Black Caps last year. Now, and though all, like that excellence came with a monster strike rate as well. And a lot of it was against Pakistan. And now Away, he is still. now he is struggling. So that like Chapman and Conway, I think there's a bigger story to tell with Conway. Um I don't I imagine he's gonna be locked in for the test team and he will need to score some runs because at the moment the the shine the polish is diminishing on Devin Conway a wee bit. Hopefully, it's just a bad patch of form and nothing bigger than that. Chapman is very T Twenty specific. I've got him as a first eleven T Twenty player for the T Twenty World Cup, given the form he had last year. But if he's slipping as he is right now, that is going to change matters because I still want to try get Jimmy Neesham into the team. I would still like to include Michael Bracewell in the squad at least. And they are both left-hander hitters in the middle order. So they are doing the same stuff as Mark Chapman, and they are both better bowlers than Mark Chapman. Michael Bracewell with his spin, Jimmy Nation with his seam. So that is a concerning pocket. It's kind of the only concerning pocket for the Black Caps in T20 cricket. I like shout out Tim Southey. He was fantastic in the two series against Bangladesh and Pakistan. 13 wickets, average of 13.9, RP of 6.5. Best Black Caps bowler across that period. I did like, I just find it fun. It's just, it's just fun. When there is a quartet, I'm going to call them the fun four. Niche case, we probably need to make it funky. So we'll go funky four. Finn Allen, Daryl Mitchell, Glenn Phillips, Mitchell Santner. Like you can take out Cam Williamson, take out Tim Southey, East Sodi, Lockie Ferguson, Adam Milne, Devin Conway, Mark Chapman, any other cricketer you want. Like take them all out and just say, we got these four lads as our funky four for the T20 World Cup and our T20 outfit. 
That's pretty good. And they're fun. They're entertaining. They're skillful. And they are really, really good at cricket. And I just, I love watching Finn Allen, Daryl Mitchell, Glenn Phillips, and Mitchell Santner go about their work, especially in T20 cricket. And I'm like, Santner, this should be concerning. Santner had one wicket, average of 126, RPO of 7.8 against Pakistan. That should be concerning, but I'm not concerned at all about Mitchell Santner. Like, he's an excellent cricketer. He'll figure it out. And that was just the ho-hum series but those dudes are all really entertaining and they're just funky cricketers and we're starting to see glenn phillips routinely impacting games with his athleticism whether it's running between wickets whether it's out in the field he influences games with his athleticism let alone the runs he scores with boundaries didn't bowl in the series so he's not a factor with the ball but like you can, there's a lot of different ways you can look at this Black Caps group, specifically the T20 team. But if we're going into a T20 World Cup with that funky four, I'm feeling pretty good of the chances to at least make the semifinals for the fourth T20 World Cup in a row. Yeah, we got a good T20 team. And they just been churning out good results and they tend to do that and it's not something that's just started this summer it's something that's been going on for several seasons and even in the format that they probably tinker the most with and offer the sort of the uh, well it's also the format they play the most which is probably why they use the most players in it but that you know that's they they remain competitive throughout i think we got a pretty strong like i think the super smash these days stacks up pretty nicely for um for talent compared to other leagues around the world, certainly outside of the big, like sort of the, the massive professional leagues, like the, um, the sort of glamorize the IPL and big bash and whatever's going on in England and maybe even South Africa at the moment. Um, it produces good, solid cricketers and those good, solid cricketers can contribute good, solid cricket at an international level. It's, it's, it's a, it's a nice procession that they got going there. And yeah, the funky four. I, I did notice Mitchell Sander dipping a fair bit. Like it, did, it didn't feel like he was the, the bowler he usually is. But then also like he missed a game from COVID and then came back like a day later. <laughs> so like he's out with, um, he's out in quarantine to, you know, look after himself. And then he's back like straight away after that. Like maybe they might have rushed him back a little bit early and he wasn't quite at 100%. So cut him some slack for that because we know how good he ordinarily is and he's got a massive uh, massive backload of career performances that show that he is a guy who does not normally get smashed. And he doesn't necessarily take a heap of wickets, although I think T20s, is, he would have the best sort of um, comparative average strike rate because he's against batters trying to hit him and he's able to use his little uh you know his tweaks and tricks a little bit more but no doubt about that uh about the funky four categorization there for him i think he fits there especially because he's such a deceptively well it's not even deceptive at this point he's just he looks like the sort of lanky um kind of uh chilled out dude who just then makes the most incredible plays in the field like his fielding is insane and i do the the one thing with this batting is i kind of wish he would try to be less of a batter and just be more of a slugger because i actually think that's the most effective aspect especially also when he has bats down the order but um you know he's had plenty of plenty of decent little cameos he doesn't bat in a position where he gets to tally up big runs at a high average or anything like that he's just got to come in and score runs and he generally does that pretty well as well Santa was the best bowler for the Black Caps against Bangladesh. Yeah. And he had a batting strike rate in the series of 173 against Pakistan. Beautiful. That goes to your point about his uh, hitting ability, but also not much whacking down the order for the Black Caps against Pakistan. Santa was the only dude... Well, Tim Southey did have 15 runs at a strike rate of 125. Santner had 33 runs at a strike rate of 173. But then you go to Adam Milne, promoted for a few more batting opportunities, strike rate of 83. Matt Henry, strike rate of 50. Ishodi, strike rate of 50. 
Uh, Ratchin Revenger, strike rate of 50. Lockie Ferguson didn't score a run. Ben Sears, strike rate of 100. So you want the batters to score most of the runs. So that's why strike rates, uh, they do elevate an importance for the bowlers. Not many of the bowlers had a whack. Santner did have a whack, 173, and that was the third highest strike rate of all the Black Caps. Finn Allen, 195, Daryl Mitchell, 183. So to your point about Santner, he is a very good bowler. He was the best bowler against Bangladesh. He's also a very good batter. He was the third best slugger for the Black Caps against Pakistan. And to your point about the skillful bowlers, there's two things here that I want to kind of extrapolate out from the Black Caps and into the Super Smash. Mitchell Santner, for example, he's got his lefty spin and he's got the delivery that just swings into the right-hander. In the Super Smash, that is what AJ Patel does. It's what Jaden Lennox does very well. And they are probably the best two spinners at it. And then you consider the other spinners, well, Michael Rippon rips his lefty leggies both ways. Peter Young, husband, rips his leggies both ways. And you've got a couple of offies who, who, you know, again, you're not getting a whole lot of spin. So you need to go about pace variations and angles and um, tricks like that. So, oh, the other one is Louis Delport, sorry, with the lefties. He's also got the delivery that moves into the right-hander. Fran Jonas also has that skill set. So just in your left arm spinners, most, if not all of them, can move the ball both ways. One way through conventional lefty spin, the other way through uh, more of a seam up, swinging into the right hand of variation. And then you've obviously got other spinners who are very skillful as well. But then you go to the seamers and I'm thinking like, the thing that I love about Ben Sears as a T20 bowler and the thing that I think makes him very effective in T20 cricket, because he is a very good T20 bowler with a T20 international average of 20 and a T20 average of 20. So Ben Sears is pretty good at T20 bowling. What does he do? He's got a very wild action and he slams forward in the delivery motion so it's very difficult to know whether that delivery is coming at 150 kilometers an hour or 120. Because everything is the same, whether it's a variation. The only thing that's going to change is whether how he releases the ball, whether he rolls his fingers over it, maybe it's back of the hand, whatever variation you're going with. But because Ben Sears bowls so fast and he is so wild, all of that can hide and mask his variations. Now, when I go through the best bowlers, especially the young seamers in Super Smash, they have a similar, very similar method. Willow Rourke just bowls heat, to be honest. Like, he's just coming in, he's steaming, he's bowling a heavy length, but a nibble into the right-hander. Again, very skillful because he's moving the ball into the right-hander. Nathan Smith is a bit more classical, but again, he's got good variations. The dude who I think about, though, is Zach Fox, because what does Zach Fox do? He slams forward, and what am I meaning when I say slam forward? I'm thinking slamming the front leg down, slamming your, not your bowling hand, your other hand, your front arm, slamming that down. So you slam your front leg down, you slam your front arm down at the same time, and everything's very fast and aggressive. Nothing changes in the delivery motion except for the ball and the variation. And I also think that that is something that is very evident in Christian Clark for Northern Brave, who hasn't had a great super smash, but he's got a similar style. Um, and someone who didn't play a lot of cricket in the super smash this summer was Matt Bacon for Otago, another very good super smash seamer who has the same style, slamming down the front leg, the front arm, but you don't know if it's a variation or on pace, pace on. You can go like Lockie Ferguson, Adam Moon. What do they do? They bowl fast. So what happens if they don't bowl fast? It's a change up and it's a very effective change up. 
Why are Dunroo Ferns and Bevan Small successful? Well, they bowl a heavy ball, they hit a hard length, and they have change-ups. Logan Van Beek, incredibly skillful bowler. Dutch international, great cricketer, fantastic catch yesterday. He's got all the tools, all the tricks. Ben Lister we've talked a lot about. He has a very unique package as a left-arm seamer. And if you can deal with that movement away from the right-hander, he's coming at you with a change-up. It's, uh, I think a lot of the older players are very skillful. You would expect that, like a Tim Southey, Lockie Ferguson, uh, Adam Milne. We expect them to have the variations because they've been around the Black Hats for a long time, and that is where you really fine-tune your craft at this level is uh, chatting to the other Black Caps, chatting to the, you know, working on your stuff in that Black Caps environment. But I think there's a lot of young seamers who have very skillful executions of those uh doosters slower balls and whatnot and someone like zach fox i think is the best at it right now of the young seamers probably because he's growing up doing all of those variations playing a lot more t20 cricket than the older dudes did but regardless of that specific skill set of the uh the slam down variation types every bowl is skillful the lefty spinners are moving it both ways. The leggies are moving it both ways. Like even Zach Fox, he's kind of moving the ball both ways with swing. He can come through your gate as a right-hander, hit your stumps. He can also attack your outside edge. Willow Rourke is hard to handle. Nathan Smith is swinging it when no one else is swinging it. And then you've got something like the McKenzie brothers are quite interesting because... Wait, so another, another like a hostile seamer with good variations is Scott Kugeline. I just remembered that. Shout out to him. He's got that style worked, uh, working well. Him and Doug Bracewell, highly skillful, highly effective seamers. But the McKenzie brothers have this thing where they have like, they, they both have very natural flow and rhythm in their bowling action. It's very evident in Jock McKenzie, youngster for Auckland, who... If we're, if we're diving into that kind of league versus union stuff, did Jock McKenzie just choose cricket over rugby union? If he did, there's a lot of rugby league, there's a lot of rugby union players who are choosing rugby league over rugby union. And now you've got a cricketer choosing, rug, uh, choosing cricket over rugby union. Because he, yeah, let's not get into the, the nitty gritty of the pathways, but he wasn't far off playing consistently for the Blues and the Auckland NPC team, but now he seems to be playing cricket. My point here is that the McKenzie brothers both have the same style. It's very fluid. It's very rhythmic. It looks like they've just been fine-tuning their style of bowling without much like necessarily like biomechanic coaching. And that's how Jock McKenzie can get natural swing, natural movement, is when it's just all perfectly aligned in a natural flow. I don't really know how to describe it, but if you watch Angus McKenzie bowl and you watch Jock McKenzie bowl, they have a same general action that looks natural. It looks like a good flow. All of which is to say, whether it's the Black Caps bowlers, whether it's the Super Smash bowlers, these dudes are highly skillful and batting wise the best batters are still the best batters there's a lot of kind of veteran batters in the super smash doing a lot of good stuff um but writing about the youngsters this morning i really like the canterbury duo of bevan jacobs and mitch hay who both have monster strike rates bevan jacobs has a strike rate of 194 which is second only to finn allen well, second only to Doug Bracewell, and better than Fenella. And he smashes the ball without smashing the ball. He just kind of times the ball and it just goes far and long. And he is a very talented hitter for Canterbury. Then you've got Mitch Hay, who has a super smash strike rate right now of 176 while also having a first-class batting average of 42. They don't really seem aligned, but that is the talent of Mitch Hay. 
I don't know if there's like a theme in the batting, other other than the best batters all being pretty old, mature cricketers. Tim Robinson's still first for runs, but he hasn't played for at least a week with Wellington. So whether his involvement in the finals will be very interesting because he's got 298 runs with a strike rate of 187, which is bonkers. Um, but all the best batters, listen to these names. Cleaver, Nichols, Foxcroft, Kelly, Bracewell, O'Donnell, Raval, Latham, Fletcher, Muhammad Abbas, McConchie, Bruce, Young, and then you get to Cartonet Clark, um, Bowes, Rutherford, Allen, Solia. Like these are all certified domestic troopers um, scoring a lot of the runs. So then I'm looking for like which dudes are chiming in. And that's where the strike rates of Bevan Jacobs and Mitch Hay are really interesting because they're scoring quickly. They might not score many runs, but they're scoring very quickly after Canterbury have enjoyed a lot of good work from Latham. Bose has found form. We're talking about he has, that. He has. Bose has found form. Um, but yeah, if you've got Bose, Nichols, Latham, there's not much room for run scoring lower down the order. So it's all about strike rates, and that's what Canterbury have. And if you're Auckland, well, Auckland are going to have... They've got Robbie O'Donnell in um, as... I think he might be the third best current New Zealand T20 batting average behind Foxcroft and Devin Conway. Um, and, of course, you've got Finn Allen in that Auckland team. So Auckland at the top of the charts in this men's super smash may be bringing in Mark Chapman. Hopefully he can find some form as well as Finn Allen, Lockie Ferguson... Um, and a similar vibe for the Wellington woman, Sophie Devine played for them yesterday. So suddenly you've got Sophie Devine, Amelia Kerr, Lee Kasprick, Jess McFadgen, Je uh, Jess Kerr. Like Wellington are going to be extremely hard to beat. Georgia Plimmer, another fantastic youngster in hot form for the Wellington Blaze. <sighs> I could keep going, but I'll, I'll let you fire up here. Yeah, well, that's the... Um that's the strength of a solid domestic circuit, isn't it? And I do think, because it's, it's always such a weird thing to talk about because of how the Black Caps really use the domestic cricket platform to allow players to develop their games, to, to get to the best version of themselves and to where they can seamlessly fit into international cricket straight away because um, they just understand who they are as cricketers at that, at that point. Um However, the White Ferns do the opposite and take players out of domestic cricket and then um, expect them to just make the jump without having had those sort of formative years. And it is something that I think has been a lot better this season because you do like when you do have the Super Smash and it's visible and there's um, you know sponsors involved and they've fully integrated the women's and the men's competitions and all this um, all this good stuff that just gives us this like sort of month of a, a spectacle of cricket. Uh, which is which is great and I think you've seen some of the players who have now like Georgia Plimmer is probably the best example of someone who had that initial like develop White Ferns development boost which is not a boost which is just chucking someone into international cricket before they're ready and ahead of other players who kind of deserve it and therefore discrediting your domestic um, system but now she's had enough cricket there to where she's had a fantastic year domestically and is beginning to turn that into runs for the White Ferns as well, which is really the point at which she should have been picked for the White Ferns at the first time is now, like now that you've got this backload. But like they do get the White Ferns all participating, probably more so than the Black Caps who have had, um, you know, games against Bangladesh and Pakistan during this um during the Super Smash window. So they're sort of in and out. You have got had the White Ferns pretty much predominantly playing throughout the thing and showing the other players around what the standard is like it doesn't matter what their standard is compared to other countries because we can't really do much about that it's like well we pick the best players who are new zealand eligible and these are them how can you compete against them and generally those players are still dominating like they're the run charts saying the same things and the wicket takers and whatever and and then also amelia kerr being the best white fern and then absolutely dominating the whole <laughs> super smash but it is a um, it is a it is progress in a good way of being able to just like set a tone and show like this is the standard that we're at and can you compete with this? And I think it is it is raising the bar for a lot of women's cricketers in the way that it has done for men over the last several years. And they have also, I think the women's competition has also been able to sneak in a couple of nice um, 
you know, international imports as well. There's been a few Australians come over and played. Um, Chamari Atupatu, who from memory was the one who absolutely demolished the the White Ferns when they went to Sri Lanka. Uh, um, uh, who was it? One of the Pakistani players stayed on and played for Canterbury as well for a few games. Like there's been some nice little um, nice examples of that as well, raising the standard by showing an international flavor. But I don't know. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed the Super Smash season and I think it's um, it's all good progress for the sport in this country. It is very random though. Like the re- reason I don't really talk about the availability because you never know. Like it's, it can yeah. come and go. Like who knows? But the so the leading run scorers in the women's Super Smash: Amelia Kerr, Susie Bates, Maddie Green, White Ferns, and respective leaders of their teams. And then you go Francis Mackay. So if you say like who are the best batters of Wellington, Otago, Auckland, Canterbury? I'm saying those four names. They are the leading run scorers for their teams in the Super Smash. And you like. I did write in our newsletter yesterday, Kate Anderson was excellent last season in uh, Canterbury's championship, fell away this year. Also, Canterbury lost Amy Satterthwaite, which is a big loss. Um, but if you go, like, she's a white fern, and she is second for runs in Canterbury. Hannah Rowe is uh, second to import Holly Armitage for runs for CD. So you go batting, and you're like, okay, like, let alone Georgia Plummer, and you're like, okay, the a lot of the white ferns are leading the run scoring in the women's super smash which is what you want to see you want to see the best players dominating and it's happening you got amelia so amelia kerr let's shout out her she's the only player with uh, over 400 runs and she is the only player with over with 20 wickets so she is in a fantastic little spot of super smash dominance and she is the best player now they welcome back sophie divine so that you know maybe wellington blaze should are going to win another super smash championship in their super smash dynasty but then like so these are the leading wicket takers in the super smash amelia kerr lee casper Marama Downs, Emma Black, Sky Bowden, Leah Tohuhu, Fran Jonas, Atapatu, Eden Carson, Mayer, Jetley, Asmussen, Watkins, Sullivan, Watkin, Mackay. There are white ferns there, but Amelia Kerr's the only white fern who is genuinely dominating Super Smash bowling right now. Lee Kasprick should always be in a white fern squad. She's dominating. Marama Downs and Emma Black. They join Sky Bowden as the best young seamers. They have more wickets, twice as many wickets as Haley Jensen, as Molly Penfold. Even Hannah Rowe hasn't taken many wickets this summer, seven wickets. And then you've got Rosemary Mayer, not in the White Ferns right now. She's there with nine wickets. The spinners are doing well. Jonas Carson, they're doing well with Amelia Kerr and Lee Kasprick, so that's a good spot. But the the emergence of a lot of young seamers dominating the Super Smash is a really interesting wrinkle in the women's Super Smash. I asked you for your top five flying Kiwis right now, but there was a recent development that is uh, quite interesting considering the... We do talk a fair bit of shit about the big old US of A and their sporting exploits and their sporting situations but youngster and sorry part of that shit talking was less kiwis going to play in the usa women's league as well as less kiwis using the college football soccer pathway as had previously been the case but then as we are recording youngster millie clegg she is off to join racing louisville and this is interesting because you talked around the intrigue for millie clegg a couple of times where's she going to end up um wasn't she meant to be with the western is that her western sydney wanderers yeah she was with western sydney wanderers and she was the one who she couldn't play until her 18th birthday which was a couple weeks into the season because you can't sign prior to that with an overseas club, even though she was changing from a team that was in the same league. <laughs> she played for the Phoenix all last season. But then, so she couldn't play for the first two or three games. And then in the game when she could play, she started, looked a little bit rusty, took a bunch of shots, wasn't quite her clinical self, but then had a collision with the goalkeeper where I think she injured her hamstring, goes off, and then 
nothing. We heard nothing. Western Sydney never updated us on, on what the issue was. There was implied that it might be out for a while. That was like second, third hand information. Um, now we know from some of the press releases about today's news that she she injured a hamstring, was about to return, then re-injured the same hamstring, and then now they've just decided, well, you were going to go to America after the season anyway, because apparently this was a deal that was sort of in the works, not s since she first signed for Western Sydney, but after and to where they were like, well, you just see out the Western Sydney season and then come join us kind of thing. Well, she had already been released early, and I kind of... I read this in the newsletter on, on Friday, I think, or one of the uh, Friday or Monday, um, kind of like putting some clues together. It seems to be like she'd put a post on Instagram of a bunch of pictures from her time in Sydney, which seemed to be the past tense. And then all these Western Sydney players are in the comments being like, miss you, miss you, miss you. Okay, well, obviously she's not there anymore. <laughs> so it just sounds like, okay, she's back. She's back in New Zealand, probably rehabbing, not going to return before the end of the season. Let's see how it goes. Well, it turns out there was something else in the works because now she's signed with Racing Louisville. And you know what the coolest thing about this is? We'll get into some of those pathway stuff in a sec, but Racing Louisville, that's Abby Ursic's club. So there's two Kiwis at the same team, which is... Um, always nice for streamlining the coverage i find is don't have to don't have to learn the ins and outs of a of a third um in wsl site and that's obviously going to be a massive help for for millie clegg in settling into a new team is to have like a compatriot and probably her country's greatest ever player as a teammate and a leader within that group i'd say that's a pretty um i'd say that's a pretty convenient aspect of this move as well would this enter your top five flying kiwis or not? Oh, I'd go close. I, I kind of didn't think I kind of because it changes so much. It fluctuates on who's playing and who's at what club, and then a transfer changes everything, and then mid seasons ending change everything. So I kind of just picked it as a snapshot of this moment in time, the top five. So I wasn't really considering the American players because they're off season at the moment, but. Yeah, it would go close, especially if I can make it a Millie Clegg and Abby Ursic tandem, then suddenly it would go extremely close and say that racing Louisville duo is, you know, one at the end of her career, one at the start of her career, but our greatest ever player and then someone who has the potential to be one of our best ever players. Um, yeah, they'd go, they'd go high on the list. And it is an interesting one because it, it, it's a... It's a Kiwi player getting amongst the American League, which is a pathway that's been tricky to get to. But it's been tricky to get to because of how rarely they sign in international players. Um, and New Zealand New Zealanders are obviously competing with players from every other country in the world to to get those international spots in NWSL teams. So they just have, like, that league, there's nothing wrong with that league and the standards of that league. It's very high. It's one of the best in the world. And Abby Ersig's... A uh, long time dominance and and that level is you know one of the glorifying aspects of her career, but it's just they th there wasn't really a pathway to get there for Kiwi players, and the one that's supposed to be that pathway, the draft. Well, only one New Zealand has ever been drafted, and the latest group of them, like you had, you know, Gabby Rennie's just finished college, right? And she is um, she's played twenty plus caps for New Zealand. She didn't even bother registering for the draft. Like there were no New Zealanders even registered for the NWSL draft this year, which just shows no one. It's just, it's not going to go there. Um, it's not going to work. Like it's, it's, it's not a valid pathway. It's better off to go somewhere else and maybe get a roundabout contract, or you can just be Millie click and be so good that you don't go to college at all because you get at the, at the age where you would be going to a NCAA team, you just sign straight with the pros anyway because you're already that good. Like she skipped four years of potential development to sign with Louisville, and we'll see how much she plays. Like she might be treated as like the 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 youth striker in the team first year or two. It's just development to see how you progress, and you never know how that unfolds. She might also be someone who gets minutes straight away. I don't know. Like we'll we'll, we'll see how that goes, but. Yeah, forget about the college stuff. She's, she's managed to skip that uh, pathway out entirely and just go straight to the top, which is massive. Like, this is a genuinely huge move. This is equivalent to signing with, uh, you know, a top flight English or French or Italian or or whatever club, which only the very best current football firms have been able to do in, in recent years. And, well, in recent years slash ever. Big deal. Big move for Millie Click And stoked for this one, hyped for this one. Let's roll through your top five flying Kiwis then and 
You might need to hit the old H and F hard and fast so we can get into some Wellington Phoenix. So don't need don't need your full deep in the mangroves context for this top yeah, five. I won't just... give the full career uh, um, roundups or anything like that. We'll just the like, yeah. like I said, the snapshot, the moment in time where they're at right now. We'll try to stick to that. Focus on why they are hot right now. How about that? So your top five. Yeah. Um, do you want me to introduce them, or are you just going to rattle them off? Oh, either way. Um, Let's go with uh, the big woodsman, C. Wood. Uh, Woodchopper pioneer, Nottingham Forest's greatest ever striker, Chris Wood. What do you reckon? I reckon enough that I'm going to try write a like full specific piece about him this uh, this week. Probably thinking probably tomorrow, and that will highlight largely the way in which he's absolutely gone to a new level since the managerial change at Nottingham Forest where he was sort of under Steve Cooper he had a manager who liked him who respected him who gave him opportunities but under Nuno Espirito Santo he's got a manager who treats him as a key player and he has played every single minute since um since Nuno came in every single minute like a guy who was alternating between occasional starts always getting subbed off sometimes just five minutes at the end of games not just for Forest but with Newcastle before that as well now he's the dude who's playing every minute of every game, including in the FA Cup as well. They had a game against Blackpool. He played 90 minutes. They had a replay against Blackpool. He played 120 minutes and scored the winner deep in that extra time period. He's played 90 minutes in all four Premier League games under Nuno, and his numbers have boosted uh, compared to what he was doing, even just when you compare it to like per minutes, like just get a ratio so it's... Um, so it's not, you know, misleading by the fact that he's only played a few games under the new manager. Get them comparing what he's doing per 90 minutes under each. And I, I wrote a bit of this in the, um, uh, in fact, I even included a, a sneaky little table screenshotted from an Excel spreadsheet on in the email yesterday for people who want to go deeper into that. But he's like, the contributions have risen. He's a key player. He's scoring goals. Um He's also, he's got one assist under Nuno, but it feels like he should have more because his sort of hold up and layoff game is fantastic. And it's it's not just a case of being in the right place at the right time a few times to score some goals. He's also creating stuff for others around him. I think he's playing as well as he has played at least since he was at Burnley. And I've been a big defender of how he played at, at Newcastle and, and at Forest before this. But specifically, this is like... This is what happens when you go all in on Chris Wood and get the best out of him. He's like being he's being given an opportunity to play to his maximum potential. And he's he's shown that in recent weeks. He's been great. Maybe the breakers could learn from going all in on a Kiwi and the uh, uh the results speak for themselves. Next we've got Katie Bowen, who I believe plays for Inter Milan. Is that correct? That is correct. Internazionale. And Why is she a top five flying Kiwi right now? She is a top five flying Kiwi right now because that Italian league is pretty strong. Inter aren't like the best of the best. Roma and Juventus are kind of have pulled away from the pack in, in recent years. They're clearly the two best teams in, um, in Italy. And then Fiorentina are pretty good. Inter are probably around about that fourth or fifth range. But that's a good solid team and a good solid league. And I feel like I got to hype up Katie Bowen a little bit more because I think the fact she's gone straight in there on the back of a World Cup where I thought she was New Zealand's best player at the World Cup and now looks like she's someone who, frankly, if if um, if Ellie Riley retires sometime soon, which might be the case, I suspect Katie Bowen is a significant candidate to be the next captain of the Football Ferns. I think she's a locked on, for someone who's a converted centre-back as well. Uh, I just feel like that, what she's doing there to go straight to Inter Milan and just automatically be a regular starter for them, playing pretty much every game for a good, solid team at a very high level. I just feel like that's easy to get swept under the rug a little bit, especially when it's not in a, a league with a you know English language coverage and, and whatnot. Although good highlight packages after every game, I like that. It always makes it easy to to cover the sports that actually put up good, not just two minute highlights, which is only the goals as well, but nice little five minute segments. So Katie Bowen just got a just got to respect a, a football ferns um, football ferns icon right now at this at this moment in time. An elite who I believe plays for Aston Villa. So why is a goalkeeper playing for Aston Villa 
in your top five flying Kiwis right now? Because I think we might have reached a point at the previous Football Ferns um, uh, window where they played Columbia and Annalite played both games ahead of the Kess. And neither of them are first choice starters at their clubs, but Leek plays at a higher level and does get those cup gains for Aston Villa. Um, looks like maybe Leek's nudged ahead in the number one status, which would be sort of a, a culmination of what we kind of knew was coming one day from the point at which she was like, 15 i think she played, first played for the football ferns um i think i think she was 14 when she debuted for the national team and then she also played at an under 17 and under 20 world cup in the same year one of a few players and that was the under 17 world cup where they went and um finished third and she was the star player and it from from that year onwards it's been like well this is a top tier prodigy like the same stuff we say about Millie Clegg, this was Annalite five years ago. Well, now Annalite seems to be sort of at the culmination of that, where it feels like she's um, at the age she is, which is only like 22. <laughs> like now she might be the football friend starting goalkeeper for the next decade. So um, while this is a little bit of a nudge, because she's not necessarily playing every single week and, and she, um, you know, nailing things down in that way, she is at least uh semi-regularly at a very high level and i did also just write a big roundup of the under 17 world cup like looking back at that bronze medal team from 2018 so that has been in my head which is also a reason why i picked an elite because of, she's been in uh she's been in stark focus for me recently we are the sons of sapi so it makes sense that sapreet singh is in your top five flying kiwis right now why else is Sapreet Singh so interesting? Yeah, this is another one of those intrigue over performance ones because he barely played in the first half of the season. He's had a couple of years ravished by injury and is just his career in general since he went to Bayern Munich is kind of, it's not quite worst case scenario, but he's had no luck along the way. Like the, the injuries he's had, the bad loans, just the bad timing, things have gone against him, which wasn't in his control, have been frustrating and then you see him play for the all whites against Ireland the other week and he was just the best player on the park and you're like yeah the, the talent is so immense and he's such a key player for for New Zealand as well and and just game-breaking creativity the kind of thing we lack so much and he provides an enormous quantity of that we just need him fit playing regularly and from a position where he had had no luck He's starting to get a little bit of luck at Hunter Rostock, where they brought in a new manager who happened to be his old manager who got the best out of him for uh, Jan Regensburg for a little while there. Um, and then he has that little spell of uh, you know friendly games over the winter break where he plays the second half and scores a goal, comes off the bench. Uh, does he score a goal? I think he set up a goal. Then he gets an assist in the next game, and then the game after that is another winter friendly starting this time and leading us into the end of the winter break and then they come back for the first game of the new year first competitive game of the new year and he's made that starting lineup they lost three nil it wasn't good <laughs> like it didn't get anything to say out of it specifically but there is a there is a very intriguing journey like trajectory that he's been on in terms of revitalizing his career over the last i don't know month and basically since that always versus island game really and that's the that's where the entry comes from. That's the kind of thing I'm trying to trying to follow and uh, get on board with. Because the sons of Sapi, we 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 need Lord Sapi back, Father Sapi, I suppose. If it's Lords, if it's sons of Sapi, Daddy Saps. Well, in Game of Thrones, <laughs> there was no senior figure. You know the the sons of the harpy they just rolled around and yeah it was everyone, more like so. a symbolic um <laughs> yeah so that's what we do in honor of yeah. sarpreet singh big man ting shout out to you our last flying kiwi in your top five is jackie hand who plays for lose fc had a good world cup bit of razzle dazzle as a striker what's up with jackie hand yeah, I think they go with Lewis, is, even though it's not spelt like that. I think that's the pronunciation. Because Lewis is a little bit too like uh, too on the nose for a team that's trying to avoid relegation this season. Uh, but that's why they signed Jackie Hand. And Jackie Hand, who, again, one of those players, went to the universities in, um, in the United States, had a pretty solid uni career as well, which not a lot of the, even some of our better players don't actually get that many minutes. And she was 
pretty solid throughout. Put a name in the hat for the NWSL draft. Didn't get picked. Instead, just goes over to Ireland United as a couple of years in the Finland division, con- like consistently given goals and assists out there, looking good. Becomes a bit of a key player for the football ferns. Um, yeah, great World Cup. Looked our best attacking player in that in that tournament. And now is at the stage where she needs that next step of her career. Signs with Lewis. Made a debut over the weekend. Sounds like she was pretty bright, pretty sharp. Hopefully the highlights are up now. They weren't up yesterday for me to see, but the lever, well, there was a replay on FA player, but who's got time for that? Um, sounds like she was you know, pretty solid, pretty decent, and they scraped away with a draw. It wasn't great. And they're still building up her minutes because she's coming from an off-season situation. So she only played about an hour, but key attacking player for the football ferns in a new situation, trying to take that next step in her career always going to be intriguing and we're right at the start of those steps that's um that's exciting as well right yeah let's swing into wellington phoenix mode where i don't know what else to say about the wellington phoenix woman respectfully i don't think they're bad they're just not very good away from home so they had a loss away from home against melbourne city fc 2-1 so they did score a goal shout out to them and now they return to the greatest football stadium in Aotearoa, Porirua Park, where they are going to face Canberra United. Let me check what Canberra United's up to. They are worse than the Wellington Phoenix women. So not only are the Wellington Phoenix women returning to Aotearoa to play at Porirua Park, where the lo- local motorcycle gangs will be having a field day be in celebration of the Wellington Phoenix women, They're also playing a weaker team, so I love that. So just before I was about to start yarning about the Wellington Phoenix, I was a bit like, uh, Wellington Phoenix woman lost away, who cares, keep it moving. But forecasting forward to this weekend, this game will be played Sunday, 5 p.m., prime time. I'm excited already. So shout out to the Wellington Phoenix woman. How about that? The Wellington Phoenix men had a gritty 1-1 draw with melbourne victory went down to 10 men tim Payne, t Payne. he got the red card he auto tuned his way off to the off the field wellington phoenix concede the goal but then win a penalty and another one one of our favorite uh athletes winton uh, not winton rufus sorry did a good impersonation of winton rufus though with his goal scoring lately yeah because Alex, games. respect to Winton Roofer, but I prefer Alex Roofer, midfielder extraordinaire. He slotted home the pen, which was good to see. There's a you can kind of take this discussion wherever you want to go. Obviously, there's an exciting Wellington Phoenix woman fixture coming up that you might want to touch on. But the one thing I will say about the Wellington Phoenix men, the dude who was playing on the right flank, I think he came off the bench and won the penalty. Uh, Oscar Van Hattem. He looked lively. And here's another one of these youngsters. It's, again, the similarities with the Warriors are endless because it's like, okay, Sifakula makes his debut, looks good. Aulia Tawa makes his debut, looks good. Taintua Piki makes his debut, looks good. Kehlani Going makes his debut, looks good. Every one of these Wellington Phoenix youngsters coming off the bench, making their debuts or starting a game in the case of Lucas Kelly Hield, they all look good. They all look like really good footballers. We've seen like Ben Olds being instrumental in some good footy as well. And I do not want to overlook the fact that uh, Oscar Van Hedden was very lively in the lead up to his win- earning of the penalty and then winning the penalty basically off of effort. Like he just put himself in the frame. Defender came in with a staunch challenge inside the box. And he wins the penalty. So shout out to the Wellington Phoenix men for staying in that contest, gritting through um, some adversity. And then Oscar Van Hadden, I thought, was pretty pretty lively coming off the bench. He was, and he has been in a couple games recently. He got an assist in one game a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember which one it was, but... He that was his first goal contribution in the A League, and he has been around the first team for about probably two seasons prior to this. And he's someone who didn't 
shine. Like, he looked like one of the better players, but he didn't stand out in the way that uh, Ben Old or Sam Sutton did at reserve level. So he was someone who was, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe he just needed a bit more adjustment. I think he's um, he's he's bulked up. I think also he's found a bit more of a wide position these days, which is getting back to maybe what he's what he did a little more in the um, in the in the reserves too. But he's a player who didn't really look like he was going to hang around long term previously but it, he's shown some bright little sparks recently and that's that's what you want to see from from young players is development it's growing it's it's above all it's like because you can i think people it's probably an american thing to be fair but when you comes to like scouting younger players i think a lot of people get caught up in like attributes and what do they do um how's their touch what is um you know, do they have a good shot cross? The what do they do in these situations? I trying to try to keep a broader mind on those things and just think how much do they contribute? Like whether it's textbook contributions or whether it's just stuff that you can't explain and maybe he's just a bit lucky, but are they getting into positions to make things happen? And he didn't for a while and now recently he has been. And it just feels like another example of a player who's improving under the under the current coach and the current regime. Um and yeah, what what more can you ask from the young players than to improve and just give give the team a little bit something in those situations? I personally think it was a travesty of a decision. Like I can't, I can't figure out why exactly that was a penalty, other than the idea of like um, the VAR. Once it's gone to VAR, they basically just look for contact, and it's like, well, did the defender touch the striker? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll ignore the fact that the striker's touch was going out for a goal kick. He wasn't going to retain it. The defender has a right to challenge for the ball, and he didn't, like, kick it. If anything, Van Haddam kicked him with the dangling leg, whatever, that kind of stuff. But I also happened to feel that the uh, Phoenix should have had a what I thought was a stonewall penalty in the first half when, when Krajev gets, like, a hand on his shoulder and dragged backwards, and they didn't call that. I thought the pain red card was fair enough. I also thought the Phoenix caught a break, even though it was – technically the exactly correct decision that offside goal that was disallowed where the dude's toe was dangling behind Paulson it's like yeah the, technically that's correct and you have to make that decision to the letter of the law but that's a massive fluke that, 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 the, that the Phoenix got away with that that is a massive fluke it was also a bit of a fluke the goal that victory scored though because the dude just slams an off-target shot that hits one of his teammates and deflects into the goal without anyone understanding what was going on so it was a weird game in which a lot of these weird little moments added up. But at the end of the day, what you see is the Phoenix team that probably got bossed for long stretches of that game by the victory for the second time this season that's happened. Because you remember they also played the victory away earlier in the season. That was the game where they famously had zero shots and came away with a one-all draw. But they had more than zero shots today, and, well, today on uh, Friday, Saturday, whichever one it was. Better, like better attacking performance there at home, but also still definitely the team on the back foot them for the majority of it and also still came away with a battling one or draw and i think for a lot of victories dominance of the ball and playing in and around that phoenix penalty area didn't create a lot of chances like they didn't have a it's not like they were missing sitters and that's why the the game was left open and vulnerable for the phoenix to to get a late penalty and tie things up it was because the phoenix you know, weren't able to control position particularly well in this game, but were at least able to defend their penalty area very well and get bodies in front of the ball and not allow clear shots. And Holson did what he had to do. Wooden and Sermon did what they had to do. They played great in this game. Like, it's a, it's a good battling performance that shows a team that knows how to grind it out. And that's probably what you'd say is lacking from the women's team in these six consecutive away defeats all of them by a single goal like when you're losing by a single goal every single time you're not getting dominated you're not getting um played off the park you're there or there you might not be necessarily the better team but the phoenix have just shown like once again the second time the season again the men's phoenix have just shown against melbourne victory for the second time this season you don't have to be the better team to get a result and even just scraping away draws in some of these away games is would have you know it's tallying up points it's keeping themselves pushing towards the um the al dub playoffs and haven't quite been able to do that but as you say they are at home against canberra this weekend canberra who do score a lot of goals and they also concede a lot of goals so that might be the best kind of team to play at the moment and realistically like off the back of a five game away losing streak going away then for another time 
four games in Australia in a row, I think, because they the one home game they were supposed to have was Unite Round, so they had to go play it in Sydney anyway. Melbourne City wasn't a great side to be meeting at the end of that streak. Like, here's the best team in the league coming off a, an unexpected defeat last week. Well, they're not going to have two off days in a row. They're obviously going to bounce back from that and be sort of kind of recalibrated um, for the challenge. And they were. They were pretty good in that game. Um, should have won by more. They left the door open. My down at Speck Meyer scores a good goal. Gives the Phoenix a chance late on. Um, didn't quite have enough in them. But I actually thought it was a solid defensive performance for most of that game and there was a bit more of that grittiness and maybe it helped that they were playing against a team where they were they knew they were going to be second best and so you just simplify the game plan and be a little bit more conservative with things maybe that helped them a bit um but yeah they just they're not yet at the stage where they've figured out how to grind out results like the men have but the fact that the men have is why they probably you know it's hard not to think of them. They, they've stayed first place with, with this result. It's hard not to think of them as title contenders if this carries on. Although before we get to that point, let's maybe just try to win the first playoff game for a decade because that hasn't happened for, <laughs> for a long time. But that's another parallel for the Warriors, isn't it? Is the way that you sort of gain this belief as the season goes along. Uh, there was, because the Phoenix general manager, David Dome, kicked up a little bit of a fuss sort of leading up to the last game about how the up the wires kind of bandwagon hasn't really happened for the Phoenix. And I did put some words in the in the Friday email about this, kind of being like, well, why would you think it would? Because first of all, their Warriors bandwagon peaked around the finals and we're halfway through the A-League men's season. So obviously we're not at comparative stages, but also the Warriors get at least 20,000 fans to every single home game. And by the end of the season, that was like, 26,000 sellouts, whatever it was. Phoenix had their best home crowd of the season on the weekend, and that was about nine and a half thousand, which beat their previous record for this season, which was about eight and a half, and ironically was set when they played at Mount Smart <laughs> home of the Warriors in Auckland. Um, so I don't think it's quite comparative, but I do think there is definitely a uh, there's a there's a um, snowball rolling down the hill kind of momentum to this Phoenix team because that was a big result that gave a lot of people a lot of belief that they can, you know, if you can get a point against a team like the victory in your off day, or at least in a performance where you're, you know, up uh, up against the wall for long stretches, and they've been consistently able to grind out results against teams that are below them on the table, which at the moment is actually everybody, but you know, <laughs> with teams outside the kind of playoff picture. Those are, those are promising signs for a team that's legi le legitimate. Um, you spit that out at the end of the podcast. <laughs> a little bit too much talking. A legitimate team that's um, long since proved doubt is wrong and is now not about proven doubt is wrong. It's about proving the most optimistic people right and how far can they go kind of thing. For, with the women, I do still think, you know, they bit get a few home games, crack into the finals. That is a successful season after two straight wooden spoons. And I think they can do that. I think as Let's much as we probably... Oh, well, they, they, they this got, is present because this is what they have to do now. This is the next... The context of the next game is we probably overreacted a bit too much to them playing a lot of home games and winning them at the start of the season for the same reason we don't want to overreact to them losing close away games over and over. It's, there is this home and away disparity and they are at home this week, right? You mentioned the Wellington Phoenix men and learning about them. If my memory serves me correctly, they lost. They were upset by Newcastle in Wellington. Yes, that was so, their first loss of the season. So now they're going to Newcastle to face Newcastle. And Newcastle, as I said, probably for their first encounter when Newcastle won, they're at the bottom of the ladder, 10th. So this is a game the Wellington Phoenix should win. They didn't last time at home. Probably learn about a bit more about them heading over to Newcastle to try and get a win and rectify their loss from earlier in the season. That is the niche cast. Big up yourself. Love yourself. We, I think, talking through the podcast, I think we might do a big old Super Smash preview um finals preview on the subscriber podcast as well as any other bits and pop bits and bobs that appear 
ahead of our Thursday recording for the subscriber podcast. So stay tuned for that if you're a part of the Patreon Fano or you've got a paid Substack subscription. You might even see it on some sort of membership area of Buy Me a Coffee as well, if that's your buzz. Otherwise, just get busy loving yourself. Have a crack. Try try loving yourself first and foremost. Be nice to other people. Kia kaha. Stay beautiful. Cheer, cheer.